Bayan didn't think it was a good idea to participate in the examinations. But concubine Karen told her that it was an opportunity to demonstrate her skills as well as distinguish herself. But Bayan was not convinced, as she stated that the emperor had his own plan, and she did not wish to cause trouble by acting of her own accord. But concubine Karen questioned, would you like to take the exam? Bayan wanted to measure her own progress but couldn't imagine getting the highest score. Concubine Karen questioned how Bayan would be returning to the palace, but she hadn't given it much thought. Concubine Karen guessed that once Bayan took position of Hagi, she would be running tasks assigned to her, but Concubine Karen told her not to be passive. Why should she rely on him when she was more than competent, and so she advised her to rise to her own strength and not the emperor's. She should show the people that she was more than powerful without the emperor's backing. And Bayan had never thought of being in a position without the emperor's support. Concubine Karen continued stating that she would be the first woman to obtain the highest score in the merit-based system with women examinees. The same concubine they had once been suspected of being a nagi. To prove her innocence, she hid her identity, took the grueling exam, and proudly achieved triumph by her own efforts. And in the end, the people would support her. This was the concubine's plan for Bayan's grand return. And so she smiled at Bayan as she questioned, Now, are you willing to rise up to the challenge? Bayan thought for a moment, and with a determined look, accepted concubine Karen's offer. Rain poured heavily outside, and the black wraiths kept themselves occupied with a game. Gehring sighed as he stated that it had already been raining for five days. They spoke about a large cave that had been discovered in the Seoul village after a mountain collapsed, and in that cave, old books and treasures were discovered. The village was located in an ancient historical site where appraisers and scholars flocked there. But a loud sound interrupted their conversation, and they looked to see the concubine neatening up a stack of paper. And after scribbling down a note, she looked to them with annoyance, and she stated that if Bayan didn't score the highest in the examination, she would hold them responsible. The black wraiths were outraged by her words, but the steely look in her eyes quickly shut them up. And as quietly as possible, they tidied up their mess, hoping not to disturb her highness. Bayan stated they weren't really bothering her, but the concubine shook her head, and she said that it is important for both the teacher and student to focus. Bayan handed over math problems, glad to finally be done with them and hoping for a break, but the concubine cheerfully gave her a poem to read while she rested. She glared at the concubine, realizing that she would always be bombarded with work as was the concubine's way, and soon Bayan regretted taking on this challenge. But the concubine showed no pity, and she told Bayan to save her tears until after she's read the poem. And so, with reluctance, Bayan read the poem. But soon Bayan's eyes turned from one of reluctance to one of intrigue as she read the poem. And once done, she turned to concubine Karen and shared her thoughts. She questioned if one of the sons of God had written the poem since it sounded like the writer couldn't be with his lover since he was a son of God even though he begged to be abandoned. Concubine Karen stated that it was a famous poem since it was written by a son of God, and it was often used in examinations. Concubine Karen stated that the poet was Gayu, and this was both his first and last poem. Bayan wondered why he'd only written one poem since he was a good poet. The concubine explained that God had punished Gayu with forgetfulness. And because of this punishment, he would never remember what he had done the day before, however, he was the first son to be released from his punishment. And this was because he had forgotten about it. Bayan grew confused by the concubine's words, but Karen continued as she explained that God took pity on his sons and sent a new master for them to obey, thus making it easier for them to escape their punishment. But the problem stemmed from the sons themselves because, while they were given a way out, and the master beside them was the only one who could release them from their pain, they were blinded by their emotions and failed to make a decision. But Gayu was different because, due to his forgetfulness, he had been freed from such emotions. He was cursed to forget things and thus forgot the very fact that God had punished him. The master did not want Gayu to forget his own existence, so she decided to become the only master for him. Gaya wrote the poem shortly after he was released from his punishment and the reason this poem was his last was because he then took his own life. Bayan then realized as she looked at the poem that the words were not a prayer to God but rather a farewell. Tears gathered in her eyes, and Karen looked at her questioningly. What does that feel like? she asked, 
and Bayan looked at her, perplexed. The concubine stated that she had never shed tears and thus surprised Bayan, for how is that even possible? She stated that it depended on the situation. When you cry, you are sad, but also when you are extremely happy, but the concubine couldn't understand the difference. She explained that after you let out a cry when you're sad, you feel much better because the sorrow leaves you through your tears, and if you cry when you're happy, you stay happy. Concubine Karen wondered if that was all there was to it. And after a moment, she let out a sigh as she said that they would be studying vocabulary and expressions going forward. Her words startled Bayan as she realized they would be getting back to work, and soon she cried out in frustration. And back at the palace, the emperor clutched at his head, longing in his voice as he said Bayan's name softly. Bayan sighed, exhausted as she exaggerated that her head would explode from all the studying. Concubine Karen joked that if that were true, her head would have exploded a hundred times by now, but this only earned her a glare from Bayan. She pouted at the concubine, but Karen only smiled in return. But with no other choice, Bayan requested to be left alone while she rested her eyes until dinner time. And soon, her breathing evened out, a sign of slumber. He smiled gently at Bayan, he wondered if perhaps he had pushed Bayan too hard with the increased workload. He poked at Her Highness's face, but Bayan only let out a soft moan in response. The concubine laughed softly as he continued, and soon his eyes drifted to the supple skin of Bayan's lips. His face flushed bright red as he stared at the pink skin. He recalled the emperor's words, as he'd been questioned if he suffered from the same fate since Gaia's blood ran through his veins. If he too was drawn to Sios. And looking at Bayan now, he knew he had to admit what he'd so long denied. He leaned closer, his body moving as if it had a mind of its own. And all that filled his mind was nothing else but to brush his lips against her own. But soon he jumped back as a voice spoke out behind him. Granny walked out with a pot of tea as she called out to buy in. The concubine let out a sigh and knocked on the table, alerting Granny to his presence. Once realizing that Bayan slept peacefully, she ordered the concubine to fetch the black wraiths for dinner. And with something to do, Karen walked swiftly to the door, all the while hiding his flushed face, glad the granny couldn't see. The granny woke Bayan up with a pat on the shoulder and, upon noting Karen's absence, questioned her whereabouts. The granny explained that she sent Karen to fetch the men for dinner. But Bayan gasped, outraged, because how could granny let a lady go to a room full of men? But Granny only looked confused because which lady did Bayan refer to? Bayan realized Granny must have assumed the concubine to be a man, since Granny couldn't see and Karen couldn't speak. But upon the mention of Karen, Granny was astounded as Bayan explained that the concubine was a very beautiful lady. Granny's confusion only grew because, based on her scent, breathing, and footsteps, Granny assumed all belonged to those of a tall man. Bayan explained that while she was tall, she was no doubt a beauty. But Granny couldn't be fooled, as she stated, people are bound to be fooled by what they see. While she'd lost her eyesight, she saw in other ways. And so she told Bayan to look at his Adam's apple upon his return. Bayan explained that Karen always covered her neck, and Granny explained that it must be for that very reason. But Bayan naively stated that maybe Karen covered up a scar, but Granny wasn't convinced. Bayan quickly changed the subject as she stated she was very hungry, and soon they spoke about dinner, having successfully diverted Granny's attention. And a few days later, Bayan received a letter from Mayunga asking about her well-being. He explained that the palace was fraught with anxiety because the emperor grew irritable, and this most likely was the cause of her absence. His thirst had also become severe. The floods damaged parts of the empire, and the emperor was caught up in quite a bit of work with no pause for rest. He explained that's why he'd yearned to meet Bayan but was unable to, causing the emperor to become more ill-tempered. Mayunga wrote to Bayan in place of the emperor, as the emperor's handwriting should always be kept secret. He requested for Bayan to respond as well as to send some of her blood in the vessel she'd received. She realized that the emperor must be in dire need for her blood. Soon she handed the letter along with the vessel to the messenger. She also requested that the messenger shake the vessel regularly and was to deliver it as quickly as possible. And as the messenger dashed away happily, concubine Karen commented on his joy as he stated that the emperor must be giving them a hard time at the palace. 
Bayan hoped that he returned before her blood dried out, she said as she sat down. The concubine stated that her blood's essence would not change, and she was sure the emperor would figure it out. And for now, Bayan was to worry about herself, concubine Karen said with a glare. Bayan averted her eyes, knowing full well what the concubine implied. She scolded Bayan as she stated that she'd asked Bayan about the marriage system's influence on society with respect to the art of medicine. And Bayan had answered, polygyny was a misshapen being that bred social unrest and inequality born from the womb of patriarchy and was nurtured by the forceful sacrifice and service of women. Concubine Karen stated that even though she was right, she should not write that in her exams as all the examiners were men, and they would never give her a good score. And so she ordered Bayan to write it once again to which Bayan let out a reluctant huff. And so she stated that once she became Hagi, she would outlaw the ratchet polygyny. And so Karen stated that she would cheer Bayan on, but it would take her a lifetime if she did not rewrite her answer, bringing her attention back to her answer sheet. But soon their attention turned to the door as Granny and Suyin walked in. They'd returned from the vegetable vendor, and Suyin told Bayan about the strange rumor she'd heard. She explained that they'd caught the culprit who was the cause of the fire at the palace. Bayan wanted to know who the culprit was, but Suyin was not sure as well. She informed Bayan all the concubines have been put on the torture rack, and this news surprised Bayan. But now she questioned whether Dan had actually ordered someone to set fire to her palace, and she wondered if the concubines conspired to commit arson. The black wraiths walked in, and Gerang pointed out concubine Taim is the culprit. Bayan couldn't believe what she heard since Itaim appeared to be the most gentle-looking one amongst all the concubines. And her reason behind the arson was to destroy the account book of the powder seller. It had listed those who purchased Reuben powder and she was one of those customers. Bayan now realized how uneasy the concubines must have felt with the fake account book that she had created. Gerang explained that she'd ordered the court lady to set oil papers alight in Bayan's study. Bayan further tried to question Gerang, but stopped as she noticed Granny's presence. Granny did not know that Bayan was a concubine, and so she would have to be careful with her words. Suyin offered to help Granny prepare the vegetables, and she accepted the help gratefully. And while they attended to dinner, the group whispered amongst themselves. Gerang told Bayan that the night of the fire they were absent from their duty, it appeared she'd stood at a foothold on the lodging's walls, which wasn't far from the study, and threw over the lit paper. But Bayan said that they'd always kept the study door closed, but that did not concern him. Gehring said that Itaim eventually disclosed the names of the concubines who bought Reuben powder, and for that reason they were questioned on the torture rack. Those who used Reuben powder directly were severely punished, while the rest were either thrown out of the palace or banished from the nation entirely. Gehring then told Bayan that the culprit behind the Reuben powder incident was none other than the concubine, Sama Hayan. But Bayan told the men that she claimed she'd never bought Reuben powder from the seller, and her name had never been in the account book. Hassan said that while she'd never bought from the seller, there was Reuben powder concealed in her letters from Minister Yi, which had been delivered in gradual amounts. After the Reuben powder incident, everyone remained cautious, however, the minister and the concubine continued to exchange letters. And so the emperor decided to launch a secret investigation. The Muko were able to secure the letters and got Minister Yi to confess. And so Sama Hayan had no way out. But Bayan was not relieved, for what good was it to get rid of the concubines if the Nagi rumors were still circulating? Bayan counted seven days until the exam, and the results would be released ten days after that. She recalled Karen's words, saying their suspicions would have faded away by then, but Bayan was sure those words did not hold true. Karen looked at her, a confident smile plastered on her face, but she was otherwise unreadable to Bayan. A few days had passed since then, and now she stood on the patio as she watched the downpour of rain. She knew that soon the rain would stop, which meant the exams were not far away. And so she told Karen that she would like to adjust her goal for this exam. She told the concubine that they would need to lower the bar as she did not believe she would be able to achieve the highest score. But the concubine stated that achieving the highest score was their only objective. Bayan told Karen that one shouldn't be so narrow minded. She believed they should work together to build a society based on respect for every individual, but Karen told her the highest score would aid her in building such a society, and her words only infuriated Bayan. 
Karen watched as Bayan laid her head down in annoyance. The concubine knew that while Bayan had not noticed, she'd been learning at a level comparable to that of a royal education. Karen knew Bayan worried as this was her first time taking a test with other examiners, and for that she studied extremely hard. He watched her as she scribbled on the paper, and but one thought crossed his mind, how endearing she looked. He quickly caught onto his stray thoughts and looked away, embarrassed. But he could not hide the blush on his rosy cheeks. He knew that ever since that day, all he could think about was nothing but Bayan, and he wondered, was it his fate to be attracted to her? But he knew to be careful so long as his attraction did not grow. Bayan stated, first place is too much, one mustn't bite off more than they can chew, you know. I'm not greedy as a pig. As she spoke, she doodled a pig, which Karen found to be quite cute. Once again he realized his train of thoughts and quickly stopped himself. He suggested they take a break, but Bayan complained that the concubine would make her read a poem in lieu of a break. And when the concubine stated to do as she please, Bayan brightened up at her words. She smiled gleefully as she stated, I take back what I said about hating you Karen. I actually like you. Bayan continued to speak, but Karen was oblivious to anything else she had to say as his face flushed bright red at her words. And this time Bayan pointed out the concubine's red face, to which Karen quickly stated that it was the result of her sweating and she would go take a bath while Bayan rested. But Bayan had other plans, as she stated that she joined Karen in her bath. Her words almost broke Karen's mind, and Bayan felt the need to explain, as she took in the look on Karen's face. We can bathe together, that way we'll save water, she said, but stopped as Karen's nose began to bleed at the thought. Bayan startled at the sight of blood and panicked at Karen's dazed look. Outside the cottage, a lone figure stood in the rain. It was none other than concubine Karen's attendant. She called out his name softly, having finally caught up with the prince. And once inside, she handed the concubine's identification to him. She explained that she'd picked up a commoner's tag to avoid unnecessary attention. But soon the blood on Karen's sleeve drew her attention, and he bashfully stated its unimportance as he recalled the shameful memory. He threw the constricting garment one side, grateful to finally be out of it. The innkeeper kept the furnace running all day, as well as the black wraiths who'd watched him like a hawk. He knew they eagerly wanted to disclose his true identity. Soon his ramblings drifted to Bayan and her studies, and as he chattered away, his attendant couldn't help but notice how lively he looked. The many expressions that drifted across his face surprised her. In Rayon, they'd learnt different expressions, and she wondered what had changed him so. Prince Carahan, she called out, drawing his attention, but he quickly told her not to call him that, as they were still in the Wadam Empire. But she wondered why the prince was still in disguise when they had already left the palace, and Carahan explained that he promised the emperor that he would return to Rayon if Bayan discovered his true identity. And when questioned why Bayan was not to know his true identity, he stated that it was his duty to teach her. But his attendant argued that there were many people who could teach her, so for what reason did he? Vishy explained that he should return to his people to seek their support, and while he knew his attendant was right, for he wanted to return and convince the elders to crown him as king before his time ran out, he explained that it was a promise he had to fulfill. Vishy questioned his actions, and she wondered why had his heart led him astray. He explained that the situation had changed and not his heart. The original plan was to tell the emperor the truth behind God's punishment as a means of releasing himself, just as they had convinced Juhiel. But now, he would have to prove Bayan to be a CEO. Therefore, the situation would have to be handled differently. Vishy spoke about Juhiel as he had aided them greatly, and so she questioned the prince about his reward. The prince's shoulders drooped down, the weight of his responsibilities heavy on him. Vishy sighed as she noticed this and explained that it was not the prince's responsibility. However, that was not their only problem. She stated that with the change in plans, her family had to open their tower and adorn the cave with their artifacts, and they have suffered a great loss with these changing plans. Karahan understood, and stated that he would compensate the family for that, but Vishy did not want to accept it, as she stated that the treasures were not important and the ancient text had been transcribed and it did not matter that they had lost the originals. What mattered was the information inside. And so she demanded an answer as to why the prince had decided to change their arrangement despite such a loss. 
After a moment's pause, he stated that that was the emperor's wish. Vichy was not convinced and stated that the emperor had refused to negotiate in her highness's name. Vichy pointed out that all this was decided by none other than the prince, and so she questioned, tell me, why do you lie? And so the prince explained that, as a son of God, the thirst was nearly a side effect, and the real punishment was to kill the person one loves with one's own hands. That is the punishment of God and the only means of escape. Carahan asked if those were the words he should have told the emperor instead, and thereafter asked for aid to rise to his own throne. But Vichy's expression did not change as she failed to understand why the prince did not do as he'd stated. Carahan paled as he realized that Vichy truly did not understand his motives. He now understood that Vichy would never understand that the emperor would never agree to such terms, just as many in their own kingdom would fail to understand since every citizen of Rayon had a similar way of thinking. And desperate to get Vichy to understand, he sprang up and explained that the emperor would never dare to resort to such a method. In fact, he would rather get rid of the prince to cover up the truth. She pondered his words, baffled as she'd understood the emperor to be a more reasonable man. Why wouldn't he choose the one and only method that releases him from punishment, she questioned. And so Carahan desperately tried to explain and he shouted, because he loves her, that's why. But Vichy found that love was not important enough a reason to throw away, he's only means of escape from God's punishment. Carahan paused, having realized why the nation was falling into ruin. And so he explained Bayan's interpretation of the poem as a farewell filled with despair. Yet they could not fathom why Gayu had killed himself right after Sio's death and released him from God's punishment. They could not recognize the sadness in his poem, no matter how many times they'd read it. Every year the number of suicides was increasing while the population was decreasing, and yet they couldn't fathom why. And that was because while they were so intent on chasing knowledge, they had lost sight of the most important thing. He did not explain further, for he knew Vichy would not understand, and so he asked about their plans. She stated that they would see results by the afternoon at the latest. The prince ordered, once it's completed, you may leave. As she was about to question the prince, he hushed her to be silent, for he'd seen a shadow near the door. But when he opened it, he found his porch empty. And he'd put it down to him feeling agitated. But what caught his eye was the tray of cookies and tea on his porch. Dinner arrived, and soon the group sat around the table enjoying their meals. They chatted away and laughed jovially, save for one who was none other than Carahan. He pondered who could have been at his door, but none stood out. No one avoided his gaze, and everyone laughed freely. But soon their attention turned to the door as it opened, and their expressions turned to one of surprise. Chu Gang entered with a smile directed solely at Bayan. They exchanged pleasantries, but Granny complained about his tardiness as she'd already set the table. But Chu Gang wasn't there to eat, only to share information. He mentioned the historical site that was uncovered after a landslide in Seoul village, and Bayan recalled the black wraiths speaking about it. Chu Gang further explained that numerous ancient relics were hidden away in a cave, including an ancient text believed to have been lost forever. Scholars had interpreted a part of it, and this transcription turned the nation upside down. He rummaged through his clothes, having written it down. And so he read that, in order to alleviate the anguished spirits of the brothers, Seo gave its blood to Taemuryong, its eyes to Gayu, and its hands to Nungwamyul. But this process was so agonizing that Seo's ebony-like hair turned completely white. That means the Seo originally had black hair. And because of this text, the empire sympathized with Bayan. Two men sat playing a game of Baduk, they spoke about her highness, who had wrongly been accused of being a Nagi, and they wondered where all the rumor mongers were hiding now that her origins had come to light. They were approached by a woman, and she shared tales of her highness. She stated that her highness had never met with nobles, let alone accepted bribes. And because she was loved dearly by his majesty, she was falsely accused out of jealousy. The two men bickered back and forth since one had once believed the rumors, but he justified himself since another CEO had traveled all the way up to testify against her. And now he wondered how daring the CEO ought to be to lie before his majesty's eyes. The lady explained that the reason for this was all because of the very first concubine from Ganic village, who had died after just one month. 
and so they wondered why seos had silver hair if they'd once originally had black hair, and the lady explained that the silver-haired seos were not real seos at all, for they'd had hunted seo and impersonated them thereafter. She explained that they had gone silver-haired from feeding on the original black-haired seos. The men gasped outraged at all that had happened, and for the loss of her highness, a precious individual. The lady appeared to be Suyin as she questioned with sparkling eyes, don't you wish our highness would return as the Hagi? The men were left flabbergasted at her words but agreed, yet they wondered if she would return after the severe treatment she endured by the people. And to the emperor, she wrote a poem, titled, You Will Pay For This. My consort burnt down my house. Was driving me away at midnight not enough? My brushes, my books, my chair, my desk. So long, farewell, all of these objects I've learnt to cherish. Throwing a fit after burning my precious belongings? I am reluctant to offer my vein. But I have no choice, for he is in pain. As they say, he who loves more has nothing to gain. He laughed at her audaciousness as she stated she would make him pay for this. He smiled as he imagined her expressions as she'd heard the news by now. Dan wondered if Bayan was happy to have been exonerated, and he was dispirited since he could not bear witness to the moment. He told Juhil to make sure everything goes according to plan as the merit-based exam would be held in three days. He questioned the happenings of Seoul Village, and his advisor explained that the area had been designated as a historical site. The palace scholars were dispatched. Although the scholars who've been there already completed the preliminary investigation, he explained. The emperor knew those scholars to be eager only because the treasures and ancient texts were deemed authentic, which was all thanks to Carahan for his excellent execution of their plan. The emperor was therefore indebted to him. Juhil noted that since all those relics came from only one family, the entire nation of Rayon was surely overflowing with artifacts. He beamed as he stated there may even be storing ancient texts lost to history. And he wondered if they should reconsider occupying their land since they'd only stopped due to the rugged terrain. Juhil hummed to himself, excited at the thought. But Dan knew Juhil's excitement would soon disappear once he found out that the emperor would instead aid Carahan in claiming the throne. He inquired about the people's reaction to the news, and Juhil explained that every year their dissatisfaction with the palace would skyrocket after the heavy rain and flood damage, however, this year, they've remained quiet. And now that it's been revealed that the concubine was falsely accused by the nobles, it was quite difficult to express their discontent. However, the emperor knew that the nobles continued to appeal for relief funds regarding the floods, and to his knowledge, he provided them financial support the previous year to prepare for the heavy rain, so he couldn't help but question, where had all that money gone? But of course, this was a rhetorical question since they knew the nobles had obviously splurged with the funds received. The emperor found their impertinence quite daring, especially with the merit-based exam upon them. He ordered his advisor to allocate a budget for disaster relief since they surely could not hand the new officials an empty treasury. But Juhil was more concerned with other matters and questioned if the emperor had already been aware that original CEOs had black hair and healed others with their flesh and blood. The emperor stated that he was unaware, but Juhil looked at him questioningly since he remained calm and collected. And so he explained to his advisor that it does not matter whether or not she was a CEO. He spoke with conviction, and Juhil knew his words held truth. Convinced, Juhil shared with the emperor a truth. He recalled the information they heard from the Ganic leader through Gareng. It stated that the emperor would be released from his punishment by feeding on a CEO, but the emperor had stated that many emperors before him had tried, to no avail. Juhil stated that they may have failed because the CEOs they had preyed upon were not real CEOs. The emperor knew his line of thought, and Juhil bravely continued as he stated that the emperor should do whatever it takes to release him from that pain. The emperor easily agreed, as he stated, if you find me a real CEO, I shall give it a second thought, but Juhil knew all to be gone, all but Lady Heian. And with his words, the emperor set his brush down and asked in a soft voice, a voice Juhil knew to be wary of. Heil, do you know what you're saying right now? You're believing hearsay and advising me to feed on my consort. Juhil explained that as emperor, he should escape his punishment even if the price was high. The Wadam Empire ruler must have no faults, for he must be perfect no matter how ruthless that makes him. 
The emperor questioned if Juhil wanted him to become perfect because he was the emperor or if he'd wished for Dan's very existence to be perfect. He knew the meaning behind the emperor's words, and so he questioned himself, was he submitting to a higher rank or to a certain character? But Juhil couldn't distinguish the difference, and so Dan explained that he was not disapproving of his opinion, for it was reasonable to demand absolute perfection from the emperor, nevertheless, the emperor too was human and was therefore imperfect. He then suggested that Juhil consider his madness a fault for being human and not the emperor, and if so, perhaps Juhil would come to terms with his imperfection. He also stated that he had never let his madness interfere with his political duties, Juhil could not refute his words. Dan rose from his chair and said that he knew how loyal a subject Juhil was, and he trusted him irrefutably. However, Dan stated that if his loyal subject had been led astray, he would have no choice but to expel him as was expected from a perfect emperor, however, he would not as a human. And so, he gave Juhil a choice. Now will you choose the emperor, or will you choose me, the decision is yours. And with those final words, Juhil left the emperor's office. He looked outside at the blinding sun shining high in the sky, out of reach, however, there was another sun that he could be near and could gaze at. He rummaged in his sleeve and pulled out a note he'd received from Vichy, and the note stated that the CO must be killed voluntarily by his own hands. And after a moment's pause, Juhil had come to a decision, and so he tore up the note and left it up to the wind to scatter away the last pieces of his mutiny. And so, the day had finally come, the day of the merit-based exams. The examinees rushed forward as they entered the palace, eager to begin the exam. Every examinee was to be masked, for their identity to remain unknown. And among those examinees by and huffed, as the heat sweltered down on her. Gayrank gave her words of encouragement but could not hide his own nervousness. A voice called out to her, and she turned to see Suyin, who held out a good luck charm to her. She'd gotten up at dawn to visit a gifted Sybil, but Bayan told her that she'd already had the charm her mom had given her and therefore she could not accept another Sybil's gift. But Suyin explained that this Sybil specialized in the fortunes of becoming a government official, and so she asked her highness to please carry it just for today. Makrim wanted to give her something as well, and so he handed her medicine to calm her nerves, but Bayan explained that medicine did not work on her. She appreciated everyone's gifts, nonetheless. An announcement was made for all examinees to head inside, and so the trio waved Bayan off happily. And with each step she took, her heart fluttered as it had been a month since she'd stepped foot inside the palace. She looked to the palace longingly, sure his majesty was inside, but soon a voice pulled her from her thoughts, and she startled as an officer scolded her for not answering. She'd taken on a pseudonym of Wadi Akme, so it is not to get recognized in the palace. It was also the identification tag given to her by Karen. As she'd applied for the position of central government officer, she would be taking the exam in the courtyard, and Bayan's excitement grew as she realized that this place was the closest to the emperor, and she laughed eagerly. Soon all the examinees were in place as they readied themselves for the exam, and as she pulled out an inkstone, a gift from Dan, the lady beside her noted the quality of the inkstone and commented that she must be from a rich background. And at Bayan's questioning look, the lady realized her mishap and quickly apologized, as she did not mean to offend Bayan. She scratched her head bashfully, she explained that she was not good at hiding her emotions, and Bayan explained that was not a good thing since she would soon become a central government officer. But the lady did not understand Bayan's reasoning, and so Bayan noted that this lady was truly innocent. She then continued to explain that in order to survive in the palace, you must be good at hiding things and using others, but the lady did not agree with her, since politics was a set of efforts taken to improve the people's lives. And if one did not do well in politics, they should be cast out since they'd failed to better people's lives. And since politics dealt with the well-being of the people's lives, it would be strange if secrets and schemes were involved. Bayan smiled as she realized that this lady was not of the corrupt kind, and so she requested the lady's name. The lady looked at her questioningly but nonetheless introduced herself as Seo Muntaymin, Bayan said they would be seeing each other more often and Bayan's words confused her. But the beating of the drum stopped their conversation in its tracks as the exam had begun. Two officers revealed the subject of the exam, which was to discuss the foundation of their nation. And while Seo Muntaymin pondered about her answer, she looked to her side to see that Bayan had already packed up. 
Bayan explained that she was done and so she would be leaving, and her words stunned Siomon Taemin since the exam had just begun. And when Siomon Taemin urged her to take her time since they had much, Bayan said she didn't need any more time since the answer didn't require much thinking. But Bayan did not leave the palace grounds yet. They had agreed to meet here, however, upon finding the meeting spot vacant, she looked around anxiously, worried that she'd arrived early. She recalled the letter she sent to Myunga as she requested a set of lady-in-waiting's clothes on the day of the exam. As she continued to peek from her spot, a voice called out from behind her, which startled her. She looked to see a Mukho behind her, and he introduced himself as Parak. Bayan recalled that she'd once seen him in the village with Gairang, and her words surprised him, for he had only been there for a brief moment, with only his eyes visible. He brought a set of clothes as per her request. And back at the emperor's office, he discussed details about the merit-based exam with his aide. Dan was surprised by the number of participants, and the candidates far outnumbered those in past examinations. More men had shown interest in the exam as they'd refused to lose to women. Juhil initially had been against the idea of women joining the exam, however, he felt it had been the right choice considering the circumstances. But the emperor explained that it was not a ploy to draw more participation because the empire would soon have many vacant posts and he would not discriminate against women nor men when filling those roles. The emperor believed that fair competition for official posts had a direct impact on the lives of people, therefore, the men would have to compete with women in addition to themselves, and the more fierce the competition, the better the people's well-being. Juhil broke out into laughter, and this drew the emperor's attention. His aide explained that he'd overheard that when the emperor had been against women taking up office, he spent the entire night comforting the Lady Heian. The emperor knew that only one group could have overheard their conversation, the Mu Ko, and his eyes blazed with fury as the emperor's personal conversations had been reduced to nothing but gossip. He was sure it was Parak, but Juhil explained that it was actually Yurik who was the only female Muko. She was fairly quiet, yet even she couldn't resist talking about her highness. And she believed that it was due to her highness that women had the opportunity to participate in the exam. She had also suggested forming a special Muko for the Lady Heian, and Juhil happily agreed as she would soon be named Heigi. Dan smiled at Juhil's joy, for he'd once been upset that she'd received the highest level of protection, the Muko. The Muko could be used to protect as well as attack, and that was why they were only available to the emperor. And he knew that with Juhil's suggestion, he now completely trusted her. This meant he also recognized her as the Heigi. He grinned at his aide as he said, I see you chose me over the emperor. Juhil blushed and bashfully stated that it would be wise to discuss this agenda once the Lady Heian returned, but the emperor stated that there was no need to wait, and he gave the go-ahead to Yirek to proceed. Juhil informed the emperor that one of the Ganic village negotiators was killed earlier this morning and was believed to be Galmi's father and not the elder, as the emperor had assumed. They'd stabbed Galmi's father in the stomach with a dagger while they'd all been asleep and all that remained was his head, and as a result, the cause of death couldn't be confirmed. The emperor laughed as they'd taken on the actions of their ancestors, and he smirked at the irony. Juhil wondered why they had refused to eat since they were fed on a regular basis, and the emperor explained that they had suspected the food to be poisoned. At Juhil's confusion, he explained that there was no poison and that all the meals were nothing but ordinary meals, and so they'd refused to eat because of their past actions, and the emperor referred to it as nothing but karma. An officer interrupted their conversation as he quietly walked in and spoke to Myunga for a moment before he advised the emperor to take rest. The emperor wondered why the sudden suggestion, and Myunga stated that he hadn't been resting enough lately. He said that refreshments had been prepared, and the emperor clutched at his head, knowing Myunga's words to be true. He'd been restless since Bayan's departure, and Myunga stated that while he took his rest he would discuss an issue with Johiel. They left the room, and soon the emperor was left with nothing but his thoughts. He suffered from constant headaches as the effects of Bayan's blood had already worn off. And while the intensity of the pain should have been the same, he felt it all the more harder now that he'd met her, and he wondered, am I addicted to her, or her blood? Another worry of his was Bayan's bloodletting. He did not have any time to see his lady since the flood damage had put the entire nation in disarray. 
and while he could make time to see her, he was rather reluctant to depart immediately after consuming her blood because he knew if he saw her, he would be tempted to kiss her and to do so much more. And he knew that when he held her in his arms, one time would become two and two times would become three. He wouldn't be able to control his urges. That of his beastly desire to seize her and drink her blood and taint her in nothing but his essence. He sighed, having worked himself up into a desire-filled haze, and he clutched at his head once again. And soon his refreshments arrived. The lady walked in head down, her face concealed. And as she set the tray down, the emperor wondered if it must be her first time entering his chambers since she appeared rather nervous. Before she placed the tray down, he told her to move it, and an abrupt clanging sound surprised him. He turned to the court lady, and what caught his sight was the short, stubby nails and ink-stained fingers. His eyes shot to her face to see none other than the flushed face of Bayan. His heart thumped in his chest, almost like a drum, as he gazed at his lady. She smiled at having been caught, but the emperor gave her no chance to say more as he pulled her into a deep kiss. The kiss seemed to go on forever, and Bayan, having missed him just as much, wrapped her arms around his shoulders to draw him even closer as she deepened the kiss. And when they broke apart, she smiled happily at him as she stated, I love you. And while her words made him happy, he'd felt a dull pain in his chest just as she'd smiled so sweetly up at him when he'd done so much to her without informing her. He stroked her face gently, and she told him that she'd thought she'd been abandoned since he'd sent her to the inn without a word of explanation. His eyes held the worry he felt as he'd told her that he would never abandon her. She clutched at his hand as she said, You feel sorry right? And when he agreed, she continued, You want to give me whatever I ask for right? And once again, he agreed with a smile at her playfulness. And so she asked for one thing, for him to tell her he loved her. She expressed her impatience, and so he hugged her body to his as he said, I love you, master. And upon hearing his words, Bayan began to tremble. He called out her name questioningly, and when he urged her to look at him, he discovered her tear-filled eyes. And as she cried softly, he wondered just how much frustration she had held back. He cupped her cheek gently as she quietly asked, Please hold me, your majesty. So he had no choice but to comfort his lady. She'd returned to the inn, and now Bayan sat in a daze, and her state didn't go unnoticed by those around her. Suyan and Gerang assumed that she had failed the exam, and so Bayan was in a state of shock. Suyan bit the bullet and approached Bayan. And so she asked about the exam since she'd left the palace later than the other examinees, and Bayan blushed as she recalled the actual reason for her lateness, and since she couldn't very well tell Suyan the details, she vaguely said that the exam was fine. Suyan misinterpreted her words and offered her words of comfort along with Gerang in the back. She apologized for making them wait but was soon interrupted by Karen. Karen wanted to go over the exam question as well as the answer Bayan had written down. Bayan looked baffled as she stated that the exam was over, but Karen only smiled as she stated that it was just as important to review the exam so to identify if any errors were made. Bayan complained that the exam had just been a few hours ago, but Karen wanted to tackle the question while it was still fresh in Bayan's mind, for she knew Bayan would surely forget. But Bayan questioned Karen's return to her kingdom, but Karen only stated that she could make time for Bayan. And so she handed Bayan a sheet of paper as she ordered Bayan to write down her response verbatim. Bayan displayed her annoyance with the request, and Karen ignored everything she dished out. She was not happy about it but complied with Karen's request, and soon she handed her answer to Karen. And upon reviewing her answer, Karen worried that not many people would understand Bayan's answer the way she did. And while her answer was correct, Bayan should consider the examiner's disposition and intention as well. Bayan wondered if she should have written a lengthier answer, but Karen only worried that few would understand the underlying meaning of her answer, and they worried she'd fail the exam for this very reason. But Granny's voice soon shouted out as she announced that it was time for dinner and she'd cooked grilled rabbit. And at the mention of Bayan's favorite dish, she took off running, excited. The trio watched as Bayan left and hurried to the table, and soon they all laughed at the delighted look on Bayan's face. They were sure that she must have passed the exam since she'd expressed such exuberance, and Gerang mentioned that he should catch more rabbits. Suyin joked that he shouldn't bring back strange berries as was done when they'd first met, and soon they laughed together, and all the while Karen watched their interaction. 
he knew his actions were pointless since he'd only done so in order to extend his time with her, and with no excuse left, he knew it was time to leave. The time had come for him to return to Rayon. He'd wanted to return having succeeded in gaining the Emperor's help, and that was why he'd put up with all the humiliation. And while he'd accomplished his goal, unresolved feelings still remained. And he knew the reason for that was none other than Bayan. It was now time to part with Bayan forever, and he knew he should focus all attention on his kingdom as it was in a dire state. He would need to conceal his emotions, as was expected of a royal in charge of a kingdom. Perhaps if he had not been born into royalty, he could have created a happier future together with Bayan. But it was not meant to be, and so Carahan accepted defeat. Being ashamed of the changes in his body since he'd begun dreaming about her as well as wanting her company and for her smile and lips to be only his, he truly grieved for what could have been. Back at the palace, the emperor and Juhil reviewed all the examinee's answers to the exam. Juhil was truly surprised by the number of participants this year. It had already been a week, and still stacks of answer sheets were left to be reviewed. The emperor called out to Juhil as he passed forward an answer sheet and questioned whether this was all there was to it. He read the answer, and it stated that the nation's foundation is the common people. And while the answer appeared to be wise with the underlying significance, it also appeared to be of little substance. And usually examiners would deem it the latter and fail the participant. But something caught his eye, and he told the emperor to pay more attention to the small writing above. The small text stated, furthermore, is a discussion an act of convincing someone logically and rationally on a topic worth illegitimate controversy? And so the participant went on to scold the examiners for not selecting an appropriate question for the exam, as they'd instead merely said a question that required a simple and unequivocal answer. The emperor and his aide were very intrigued by this participant, and Juhil said that the examinee was a young lady and she'd been the first to submit her response shortly after the exam had begun. The style of response seemed very familiar to the emperor, and he wondered if the examinee was none other than Bayan. The emperor asked for the name of the examinee, and Juhil told him her name to be Wadi Akme. But the emperor still doubted this examinee was not his lady, and after a brief moment he gave first place to this participant. Juhil was surprised to see this, and when questioned why he'd given the highest score to this examinee, he explained that her response combined with her note was the closest to what he thought was an ideal response to the exam question. His aide pointed out that he'd given the highest score to a woman, and the emperor told him that he'd chosen her based on her abilities and not her gender. He advised Juhil to not conform to stereotypes. He told Juhil to not confine himself and his beliefs in a small box because, with that kind of thinking, he would be resistant to change. He bowed an apology, but the emperor waved him off and then questioned about the noble's recent actions. Juhil found that other than a handful that had written to the palace, they had not taken any discernible actions as of late, and the emperor found it to be extremely unusual. Juhil theorized that perhaps they could have given up after Her Highness was proven innocent and the people's rage had turned towards them, but the emperor still felt uneasy, and so he ordered, make sure to use the account book at the ceremony. For his soldiers would surround the capital and ensure that no one escaped, as it turned out that nobles had been confiscating lands from the commoners, and since they had all gathered in the capital, it would now be easier to capture them. The emperor had also hidden soldiers on the outskirts of the capital for twelve years in preparation for this moment as they would act as a strong deterrent to any nobles attempting to flee. And because they would reveal the account book at the ceremony, there was no need for confessions, so penalties would be carried out as soon as possible. Juhil bowed in consent and thereafter questioned when the Lady Heian would return, as the head court lady inquired since she would like to prepare and decorate the palace beforehand. At the mention of Bayan's return, the emperor's heart skipped a beat, and he blushed just as ready to have her back. And so he ordered that she would be returning ten days after the ceremony, and he would be promoting her to the Lady Tayan. So they were to prepare the nearest palace to him. Juhil sighed as he said, you might as well share your palace with her. He said it as a passing joke, but after a moment's pause, the emperor stated that was a fantastic idea, and Juhil gasped at his words. Soon the merit-based appointment system results were posted on the board, with first place taken by Wadi Akme, Bayan's pseudonym. Bayan's entourage was stunned that Bayan had taken first place. And so it stated that the successful candidates listed were required to attend the ceremony, which was scheduled three days from today. 
she stood at a distance, and she determined from their response that she'd not done well. She approached and hesitantly called out to her attendant. Suyin turned to look at a lady with tearful eyes, and soon she threw herself into Bayan's arms. She was not the only one who cried from joy, as Gerang and Makrim too had tears running down their cheeks, proud of their lady, who had passed with the highest score.